Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. An Incredibly Creepy Family by Victoria Around 2018 or 2019, I, a 25 female, at the time I was 18 or 19, was living in Nebraska where I grew up. I lived in the largest city in Nebraska, but it was still essentially surrounded by corn and wheat fields. The city was expanding, so rich folks started building huge houses with giant properties on the edge of town as things proceeded to grow. All of that being said, I had a good friend whose parents' house was one of those big ones right on the blurring line between the fields and the city. My friends and I were constantly hanging out at his place because it was fun. They had tons of property to ride 4 by 4s on, a hot tub, a huge living room for us to watch sports, and have reality TV binge sessions, etc. Plus, his parents were super cool, and we could drink out there as long as we stayed at the house. It was tons of fun, even though I was and am quite scared of the dark. So I would just not go outside after a certain time because there was little lighting and the nearest neighbor was about a mile away. I always felt a weird energy driving to and from his place if it was late at night, but never had anything happen until one night. The drive out there was a long, winding, two-way road that had thick trees on both sides and you passed one of the city's largest cemeteries on the way. Barely any lighting, of course, besides the street lamps every once in a while, and very little traffic. It was all inherently a bit creepy, and I'll admit to having sped through this section of road many times to get through it as quickly as possible. This specific night was perfect spring weather, so I was driving with my windows down listening to music. It was around 8 p.m., I was going around one of the curves in the road when I had to essentially slam on my brakes. Right in front of me in the middle of the road, maybe 50 yards away, was what looked like a family. Again, picture a completely pitch black road with thick forest on both sides and only my headlights to show what was in front of me. This was a family of three or four, a tall, slim woman, an average height weight man, a child, short hair but couldn't tell the gender based on the clothing and couldn't see their face, maybe around eight years old, and the mother was pushing a fucking stroller. Their clothes looked normal, not tattered, but not nice. They were all facing away from me, walking casually in the middle of the road, in the same direction I was headed. The hairs on my arms immediately stood up. I came to a stop in the road, obviously, and just sat there for a moment. They seemed to be completely unaffected by me and didn't even turn their heads slightly, nor did they attempt to move out of the way. I literally thought I was going insane or that I was dreaming. It was so surreal. Before I really had time to fully process and register what I was seeing and how truly strange it was, they all, at the same time, stopped walking and very slowly turned to face my car. This scared the absolute shit out of me. I honestly didn't even give myself enough time to look at their faces as they turned. I immediately threw my car in reverse and sent it backwards for probably a full 20 seconds before flipping a U-turn, nearly running myself off the road, and then I booked it in the other direction. The only thing I remember noticing is that the stroller looked to be completely empty. This was the part that sticks in my mind the most. I've never felt terror like that in my life. I checked my rearview mirror probably a thousand times before getting to a main road and never saw a glimpse of them. In fact, I never saw a glimpse of them ever again. I tried asking my friend and his family about it, only to essentially feel like I was insane because of the way they looked at me. Every time I tell this story, I get one of three reactions. People immediately think I'm fucking cuckoo, and they think I'm lying, or have had something sort of similar happen to them. I really don't care if no one believes me, honestly. It was, and still is, the creepiest thing to ever happen to me. I think about it all the time.
It was either some weird-ass family trying to scare the shit out of someone, a distraction for an attempted robbery or assault, or it was something more sinister. I'm going to tell myself for probably the rest of my life that it was the first option. A Strange Woman Came Into My House by Lara It was my day off and my husband was traveling for work. I had just gone upstairs after a run on our treadmill, which we keep on the ground floor where our garage is. When I got upstairs, I was about to hop in the shower, but on my way up, I saw these two plastic skeletons I bought for Halloween. The plan was to hang them up on the awning so it looked like they were sitting on our front balcony. It was a bit dirty out there, so I decided to put them up before I got in the shower. So there I was, outside in only leggings and a sports bra. I had to bring a chair from the dining room out there so I could reach the top of the awning. And there are hooks for hanging plants up, so I was using said hooks to hang up the skeletons. The door to my house was ajar while I was doing this. When I was done hanging them and adjusting their poses, a woman came running up the stairs to our front door. To be honest, I was so startled that there was a random woman on my porch when she said, I'm dying of thirst. I'm so thirsty. Can I have some water? I just went inside and grabbed a water bottle. We recently had a box of bottled water delivered, so they were just inside the foyer. The woman followed me inside, and I started to panic as I realized I was now inside my house with a strange woman. I mean, there were a lot of homeless people and junkies in the neighborhood. But this woman was well-dressed. Besides that, she was wearing a wool pea coat in 80-degree weather, which is odd. I'm a small woman. She was probably a head taller than me and outweighed me by 30-plus pounds. She chugged the water bottle and started chatting with me as if we were old friends and asked how long I'd had the house and where my parents were. I'm over 30, so that was a weird question. I told her my parents had never lived there and then said, I have to leave soon, so you'd better get going, and literally shoved her out the door. I texted my husband, who was overseas, and could see on the ring camera that she left the property. He kept asking me why I let her in, and honestly, I'm not sure why I did. But I also really didn't expect her to follow me inside. So, strange woman from the sidewalk who came into my house? Let's not meet. Camp Raggeds, Colorado, by New Possible. My friend and I backpacked into the Raggeds. We found our campsite nine miles from the trailhead, and our plan was to go hike to a basin to try and summit a peak the next morning. We woke up at 6 a.m. and got ready for our hike. We walked on the trail for a few miles till we couldn't find it anymore, so we decided to just follow the creek up. We walked up the creek for a mile or so, but it was too slippery and sketchy to keep going. We decided to get on a shelf probably 100 feet from the creek. The shelf wasn't any easier. It was covered in ferns up to our necks, and we realized we needed to find some sort of game trail or easier way. While we were making our way through the ferns for a mile or so, we decided to go filter some water at the creek. On our way down there, we found some trash two soda bottles and a jet boil canister. We thought it was odd because of how remote we were, and I asked my friend if he thought it would wash down in a storm. But that didn't make much sense for that to have happened. We continued on and made our way down to the creek to filter some water and took some time to recover. Then we walked up into the forest and found a bone hatchet laying on the ground. I thought it was pretty cool and wanted to keep it. Then we started to look around the area. That's when we came across the campsite. The first thing I noticed were some XL gloves half buried in pine needles. I looked up at the tree they were under, and there were deep gashes in the tree, possibly from the hatchet. I thought it was odd, so I told my friend to come and look. And this is when we both just felt some bad energy. But we decided to keep looking around. I picked up some trash and put it in my pocket. When I heard my friend yell, Come look what I found. It was a tiny pond. 
The first thing I saw in the pond was a basket. But I looked harder, and there was a big black tarp, and it looked like it was wrapped around something big. My heart dropped. Right when we saw that, our fight-or-flight instincts took over, and we decided to run. We ran up towards the basin, and the forest where we were running was thick and steep. I mean, we felt like animals running from a hunter. When we got far enough to feel safe, we tried to rationalize what we had seen, but honestly, we couldn't. We had to go back down to the creek because we got cliffed out. So we followed the river for another mile or so before it started to open up into a wetland area. We found a hunter's campsite and the trail, which was a relief, so we kept pushing to the basin. We found a little stream and filtered some water, but didn't fill our water bladders up. We started to follow the trail up to the ridge, and we were pretty much just following elk trails the whole time until we realized that we were running out of water. We looked at our GPS maps and saw that there was drainage about a mile from us, so I decided to keep pushing, hoping it had water. We lost the trails again and just decided to walk across a super high exposure shale field to get to the drainage. But I was dehydrated, my legs were cramping, and I could barely take another step. I almost fell a thousand feet to my death multiple times on that shale field. Finally, we made it to the drainage and there was water. We filled up our bladders and drank a lot of it until we felt better and we decided to keep pushing through the shale. We got up on the shelf, and that's when we saw how far we actually were from the basin and the peak. So we decided to turn around, and the way back went a lot better. We bumped into the hunters who were camped and talked to them for a while. We told them about that other creepy campsite, and the hunters said it would definitely be the best place for someone to do some sketchy stuff. He showed us his GPS app so we could follow the trail back instead of bushwhacking. He said, if you guys get in the shits, you're too low. The trail will never go near the creek. We headed back to our campsite, and when we got there, we looked at the hatchet closer. It looked like it had blood splattered on it. We put it away and tried to have a good night at camp. The next morning, while we were hiking out, we came across some other hunters, and we started talking to them. We just kept getting red flags from them, though. They told us they had rented some llamas and they were at their camp. We hiked down to their camp and from across a creek, we just saw so much smoke coming from where their campsite was, we thought the forest was catching fire. We dropped our bags and ran. They had left their campfire smoldering and there were sticks on the hot coals and a bag of blackbeard fire starter on the hot rocks right next to the fire. We put the fire out and hiked to go tell the Forest Service and the Pack Llama Company about those people. My friend turned the hatchet into the local police department. We are still waiting to hear back about everything. Stay tuned for an update. The Tinder Stalker by Not Ghetto Enough I matched with a man on Tinder one day. The conversation got spicy, and I gave him my number so we could continue chatting. We texted that night, and we never exchanged photos or nudes or anything like that. We never made plans to meet up. The conversation died, and I forgot about it. Weeks went by, and I deleted the conversation. Then, late one night, I got a lewd photo of a man I didn't recognize. I thought of insulting the person, but decided to just delete it and not respond. A few weeks later, I got another one. I had the idea to check my deleted messages to make sure I didn't know them. Sure enough, I found out it was the Tinder guy. It was really weird of him to text me a month later and just lewd images after no contact or anything for over a month. I mean, ugh. So I blocked him. A couple of weeks later, I got a lewd video on my Apple Watch. It was the same guy. I'm not sure how I got the message on my watch if I had already blocked his number. So I blocked him again on my watch, and I thought, what a weirdo. A week later, I was leaving my apartment to go for a walk, and I saw him. 
He was right there in front of my apartment walking towards me. He had on the same outfit as his profile photos and some tattoos and a hat, so I was certain it was him. And I had never mentioned where I lived, so that freaked me out. But I was dressed in baggy clothes and recently changed up my hair color, so I just kept my head down in hopes that he didn't recognize me. I walked right past him, too scared to look at him to see if his reaction was recognizing me. I was too scared to look back in his direction, too, to see where he had went, so I just kept walking forward. I was severely freaked out, but nothing else happened after that, and I never saw that guy again. I mean, I never mentioned where I lived, so my only thought is he must have used my phone number to look me up. It was the least likely person I would have expected to show up there. I mean, just some random person I messaged for only one day on Tinder. Even with the lewd content he sent, I still just thought he was a regular perv. I never expected him to somehow show up at my apartment. He didn't even text a word to me or attempt to meet up. He just sent lewds over two months and then disappeared. It was so random and odd. I think his motive was definitely something sexually perverted, and it gives me the creeps to think about what he wanted. But I'm glad he left me alone. I never give out my real phone number to dates anymore. Creepy Paper Root Customers by Sheva From age 13 until I was almost 15, I had a paper route. I delivered papers to people's doors six days a week, and all of my customers, aside from occasional grumps and chatterboxes, were absolutely wonderful. Most of them were older, and so many of them were so happy to see me every day just to have someone to talk to. Many of them would leave me granola bars or water bottles and even tips. Winter holidays were a great time because everyone who could left huge tips. It was a pretty good first official job. Eventually, some of the snowbirds moved back and became my customers. One couple, Louise and Gerald, will always stick out in my mind. They started off as normal, pretty friendly people. But I noticed one Sunday, the only day I had to get up early to deliver papers, that Gerald was outside. He chatted me up, and it was nothing unusual. Because it was so early and because I'd usually go right to bed after I was done, I was wearing a Britney Spears shirt and a pair of polar bear pajama pants. He complimented me and said I was dressed cutely. I mean, I was confused because it was pajamas I just threw on randomly. I was confused by the compliment, but I just went on about my day and didn't think much more of it. Something else to note, his wife Louise was always smiling. I couldn't pinpoint why, but it kind of unnerved me. In retrospect, it gave me the meek and mild subservient trade wife vibes. Anyway, I had noticed that in their garden, there were three different dog headstones that all said Fido on them. I was kind of confused as to why they all had the same name, but I figured maybe multiple people had bought them and they wanted to be polite, so they put them out anyways. One day, Louise was out and she had a dog with her. She introduced the dog to me as they had just adopted her. And guess what? They named her Fido. All of the dogs they had were named Fido. And they were all Shelties, just like this one. I thought it was weird and I told my mom about it, and she told me to not be so judgmental, as it was probably one of the ways they dealt with their grief. And here's the thing. They kept trying to get me to go inside. They'd invite me in for tea, which is not really something people do where I'm from. Coffee and donuts is a little more commonplace, but even that isn't something people do on a regular basis. Sometimes they'd invite me in to talk to them, and I'd always decline because I had more papers to deliver and I wanted to go home. Gerald kept complimenting my outfits, even when they were pajamas. One morning, he did this while getting closer to me and eventually touched my shoulder. And I was like, uh, I gotta go. And I left. I didn't tell my mom at the time as our relationship was good at that point and I feared that telling her any of my concerns would make her not trust me or make her mad. 
This was also at the tail end of my CSA, which she doesn't know about to this day. And I thought maybe I was just paranoid. Then, right before I moved and I gave up the paper route, a really bizarre incident happened. It was a Sunday, the last Sunday I had the paper route to be exact. I was out early delivering papers, and it was still kind of dark out. Gerald was outside. He complimented my outfit again, getting all creepily close. He invited me inside, and I said, I really don't think my mom would appreciate me being gone for longer than she expects me to. She's strict. That wasn't the whole truth, but you gotta do what you gotta do. He seemed to get kind of annoyed and just asked, Wouldn't your mom prefer that you respect your elders and not turn down an invitation? I felt the color drain from my face, and I noped out quickly. I muttered something about how I really had to hurry along because my dog was sick. I heard him say some more compliments about how my hair looked pretty. I have very wavy curly hair that gets very puffy and voluminous when I'm in the humidity. And he would bring it up a lot, saying that my hair reminded him of the 80s. I booked it as quickly as I could to the next house, without running. I didn't see Gerald after that, but I did see Louise, and she never stopped inviting me to come inside and play with Fido or have tea. I always declined, and she always seemed disappointed every time. I mean, maybe I'm just paranoid, but Gerald and Louise certainly had some funky vibes. Really Creepy Stalker Dude by Anne I'm 20 now, and this happened in October or November, so not even a year ago. I was homeless and couch hopping with friends or sleeping in my friends' cars and drinking a lot. One of my friends had met this dude in the same neighborhood who they had done deals with. This neighborhood was known for old crackheads, basically, so he was a bit younger but looked like he definitely dabbled in some hard drugs. You know, sunken face and eyes with scabs on his face. He was generous and welcoming, though. And he was obsessed with his cat, so I thought he was an innocent guy. My friend, her boyfriend, and I think one or two more people and I went and chilled to drink at his house. He was a cool dude. A little weird, but he was all right. I can get along with the weirdest people, by the way. Then, a few hours rolled by and everyone was ready to go home, and my friend asked me where I needed to go for the night. I, of course, didn't have a plan. I never did. The guy then offered to let me stay there after hearing my situation. I said yes very hesitantly, because for some reason my skin kind of crawled when he offered. I don't know if it was intuition or what. My friend then insisted and said I should stay there if I had nowhere else to go. So I agreed, and everyone left. The guy yapped my ear off about spiritual things that didn't make any sense to me. He then said he was going to bed and offered for me to sleep in his room. I walked into his room to check it out, and he had a day bed that pulled out under another bed at the bottom. So I was like, okay, I don't have to sleep with him, so that could work. Also, I forgot to mention it was a trailer home that was not well kept up. Dishes were nasty, piling up and attracting all sorts of bugs. Counters were covered in resin, tobacco, soda, like it had never been cleaned. The living room was clean, but that was it. He started clearing some clothes off of the upper part of the bed so he could lay down, and then stopped and was like, never mind, we can both just sleep on the bottom one. I looked at him and said, you know what, I just think I'll sleep on the couch. He insisted it was okay and that he wasn't going to be weird, and he was acting like a kid begging me to buy him a toy. I insisted on sleeping on the couch, and he got upset and laid in his bed. Then, like 30 minutes later, he said from the other room something like, you know what, this is weird, maybe you should stay here. He proceeded to say he needed to be alone, and I was like, dude, it's 3 a.m. You're whining because I won't sleep in bed with you. I don't know you. Then he kept insisting on me sleeping in the room with him. I kept declining and said, I'm going to sleep. He said, fine, 
but that he was kicking me out in the morning. That was totally okay with me. Morning came around, and he woke up and started making pancakes. I then asked if he could drop me off at work since I was working that morning, and he said yes and acted like nothing had happened the night before, and then again started yapping my ear off about spiritual bullshit. As it was time to bring me to work and finally leave this guy's house, he did drop me off at work. I worked all day, and while I was still at work at night, he somehow had gotten my number from someone and texted me. He said something like, Hey, I got a case of beer and some weed if you want to come over. I told him I had other plans. He then texted again and said I had told him I would hang out with him later. I never said that. So I just ignored him. He texted me a couple of more times with a question mark. Hello? I ignored all of them and didn't think of him or see him again. Fast forward a week or two later. And this guy comes into my job and asks someone for a job interview. I recognized him, of course, and was very scared and did not want him working with me at all. He got an interview from my manager somehow, and then he left. A co-worker came up to me and was like, Hey, you seen that weird dude that just came in? I mentioned that I somewhat knew him and that he is, in fact, very weird. My friend then brought up the fact that maybe he was trying to stalk me. I mean, it was a joke at first, and we laughed a bit. And then he continued his work, but did warn the managers what I had told him, just in case. So the manager emailed the guy immediately, saying that he wasn't hired, and I was relieved. Then, I shit you not, not even an hour later, this guy came back to my job with a different outfit and asked for another job interview. This time he was looking around the place all sketchy, and I ran into the bathroom because now I thought this man was stalking me for real. Thankfully, the first person that saw him was my co-worker, who I had just been talking to, and thank God he was a smart, protective man, because he told the creepy guy, you just came in an hour ago and already got an interview. You didn't get hired, and you need to get the fuck out. The guy left, but not without a bit of arguing. After I came out of the bathroom, my co-worker gave me the rundown on what had happened and said that the guy was definitely bad news and told me to never go near that guy again. And I haven't. I don't know what might have transpired from all of that, but it probably wouldn't be anything good. Assaulted in My Own Home by Janix Binch. Warning, story contains sexual assault. I was living in Morgantown, West Virginia in an apartment complex called Timberline Apartments. I was in grad school at the time and had a roommate who was out with friends on that night, April 1st, 2016. That night I was hanging out with my then boyfriend. We were just hanging out and then I took a nap. My boyfriend was meeting a friend from out of town at his place, and he just lived a couple of apartments over, so he'd left during my nap. He woke me up and asked if I wanted him to lock the door behind him, and me being lazy, and since nothing scary had happened before, I said no. It's fine. My roomie will be home, and I will get the door when she gets back. I figured it was only around nine, and she should be back in a couple of hours anyway. I mean, very stupid, yes, I know. I'd lived in this complex for three years, and nothing had happened before, so I felt safe there. To be honest, I was also half asleep, and I just didn't want to get up. It was around eight or nine at that point. I went back to sleep and woke up again to see a tall person coming through the hallway outside of my room. This was around 11.30, and I thought it was my roommate finally home. But then I realized that this person was way taller. He filled up the entire door as he came into my room. It was a man, maybe in his 70s or something, tall, bigger, and with gray hair, and with a white scratchy beard and glasses. He was wearing a raincoat and maybe jeans. I can't remember. He came into my room to my side of the bed and started talking to me. He said, Hi, you know me. It's David. You invited me. 
I said, I think you've got the wrong house. I didn't know him, and he needed to go. I mean, I was in bed naked already because I sleep that way. He kept insisting that he knew me, and I asked him to come over. And then he sat down on my side of the bed, and I remember saying, Hey, I need you to get out of my house. I don't know you, and I think you have the wrong house. I want you to leave. He still didn't leave. I reached over for my phone slowly, and he pushed it away from me. I then realized that this man was not a senile old wacko in the wrong house. This guy was a predator, and all of this was bullshit, and he was not going to go. He pulled the covers off of me and started touching me and fingering me, and I was trying to get away, but I couldn't think of how to get around him because he was between me and my bedroom door. My four-poster bed was in the way. Maybe I'd just have to jump over him. I essentially froze, letting him finger me while I figured out what to do. I decided since he didn't seem like he had a gun, and even if he did, he wasn't going to just do what he wanted to me in my own fucking house without one of us dead. While he was distracted by assaulting me, I slowly pulled one of my legs up to my chest and turned to the side. He wasn't paying any attention at all, and suddenly I kicked his stomach as hard as I possibly could. He flew off the bed and slammed into the wall, and I was about to grab the lamp and smash him over the head with it. But he looked at me with eyes wide in terror, and he turned and ran. I was still frozen and turned about to grab my lamp because I didn't know if he'd left my house. I got up after a few seconds, still terrified. I mean, what if he had a weapon or was coming back? I looked through my house, and no one was there. The door was wide open, and I saw no sign of him outside. I mean, I didn't want to see him. The only thing I was worried about was as if my cats had run away, but they hadn't. I closed and locked the door, hyperventilating. At first, I called my parents because I didn't even know what to do. Of course, they told me to call the cops. And I did, and then called my boyfriend and told him what had happened. I was like, can you come over? And he said no, because his friend was over. He had me go over there, and I asked, can you walk with me since an unknown man literally just raped me? I don't remember if he came to get me or if I had to run over there alone. But needless to say, this is one of the reasons he's my ex. When I got there, the cops met me at my ex's place. I'd also told my roommate what had happened, and she came with two of her friends to join all of us, including the cops. I told everyone what had happened, and my roomie was really upset and shocked. I asked my roomie if she could let the cops into the apartment so they could look around and make sure nobody else was in there. She said okay, and they went. Nothing was amiss. After taking my statement, the cops said I should go to the hospital and complete a rape test kit. I hadn't realized at the time that getting fingered was still rape, technically. My boyfriend drove and sat with me during the whole thing. As I was literally getting my pussy and ass swabbed, the nurse made a point to be like, what a good boyfriend sitting with you through all this. I know my boyfriend wouldn't have done this. And I'm like, woman, I've been assaulted by a stranger and you're praising my boyfriend for being here? Fuck all of this. Anyway, the aftermath of it is that nobody found this guy. I have a suspicion he was a resident of the apartment complex. I learned only a month later from a different friend who lived on a different side of the complex had caught someone peeping in their bedroom windows. Want to believe it's probably the same fucking guy? Apparently, multiple tenants had seen someone creeping in their windows, and I lived on the ground floor, so yeah, that all really checks out. I thought I saw the guy on my way to class a couple of weeks later accepting a package from FedEx or something in the middle of the parking lot. And I just stood there staring at him, trying to decide if it was him. But I had to catch my bus, so I left. I told the management people of the complex, some 25-year-old kids, about what happened, and that I saw someone who lived there who looked like the guy. And they knew who he was, and they were all like, Oh yeah, we asked him if it was him, but he said it couldn't have been him because he has cancer. They of course wouldn't tell me the name of the guy. I felt like, bitch, cancer doesn't stop you from trespassing into someone's home. 
Are you guys serious right now? You didn't let the cops interrogate him? The cops had talked to management, but nothing happened. They sent some cop cars out for a couple of weeks to just patrol the parking lot, but that's all that was done. I hate to say it, but the story ends there. I still have PTSD around old men who get too close to me. And by the way, the detectives didn't return my calls, and I believe my rape test kit still probably isn't processed. My dad, in his rage and grief, blamed my ex for all of it, since he didn't make me lock my door. And I told him that that was unfair. It was my choice, but I couldn't change my dad's mind. He hated my ex, and honestly, he was right about him not giving a shit about my safety. I found out out later, so whatever. The only good thing about this entire story is I still remember the feeling of my right heel shoving into that creep's soft, shitty body, and then hearing the thud of his back hitting the wall. The look of terror in his eyes may be the only justice I ever get. Thanks for sharing this. It was a fucked up thing. And the moral of the story is to lock your fucking doors. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on this channel or the podcast, email it to Uncle Josh True Scary Stories at gmail.com. I read them all. If you like this video, please show me that you did by giving it a thumbs up. Leave a comment in the comments section. I would love to hear what you thought of the stories. And of course, hit that notification bell for every time I upload. You can follow me on social media. There's links to that in the description. And if you'd like to support the channel even further, find my Patreon page link down there and maybe consider getting some Uncle Josh and Campfire Crew merchandise. There's a link to my storefront at tpublic.com in the description. If you have a true scary story about Halloween, please send it my way. Uncle Josh, true scary stories at gmail.com would love to have it part of this year's annual Halloween extravaganza. Everyone, be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.